Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Easy Equities webinar with CoreShares. I'm your host today, Sean Keeling, and today we're joined by Chris Rule, who's Head of Project and Client Solutions at CoreShares Asset Management. Uh, so welcome, Chris, and thanks for joining us. Today, Chris will be chatting to us about the topic, where can I find, uh, where can I find help deciding what to buy or sell? So during this webinar, it will help simplify the starting point for making investment decisions for you. Um, so thank you to all of you for taking your time out of your day to join us. Um, it's awesome having you guys here, and I hope you're all keeping safe and sane during these difficult times. Just a reminder, if you are looking for more information around ETFs, please check out our Easy ETF platform at easyetfs.com. And if you're looking for a recording of this webinar, it'll be added to our e Easy ETFs webinar page. Um, that's that same page that you came and registered for the webinar here. We're doing a series of uh, webinars with core shares. We've, we've done a few, and we have a few upcoming in the next month. So please also just make sure to check them out and register for them. And just before I start, I just want to see if everyone can hear me. Can you please just raise your digital hands if you can hear me? Okay, thanks everyone. I see a few hands going up there. Um, please ask questions as we go and Chris will get to them after his presentation. So enough of me talking. Over to you, Chris. Thank you, Sean, and, and thanks to the, the, the Easy Equities team for hosting us again um, in this webinar series. We've really enjoyed it so far. I hope you have. Um, a big, big thank you, though, to all of your clients and, and, and all the investors who've joined today. Um, we really look forward to this session. I think it's going to be interesting, um, and, and I hope there's some you know, uh, nuggets you can take away and it will help you on your investment journey. Um, as Sean said, my name is Chris Rule, and I head up uh, clients and product solutions at CoreShares, which is really the investment side of the business. Um, so please, you know, um, load up your questions. I'm going to take the questions afterwards. Sean will usually um, put them together and then ask them to me. And and yeah, let's let's have some fun and and, and make it as interactive and engaging as possible. Um, today we we're talking about a kind of an age-old investment problem of deciding what to buy and sell. Now, it's quite a loaded topic um, insofar as, you know, I think everyone wants the secret sauce or the secret spice of, of, of what to buy and sell. Um, and, and really, that's what the, the, the elixir, if you could call it, of investments. And, and, le and let's look at this, you know, what should you be buying and what should you be selling and when should you be buying and when should you be selling? And, you know, that could be shares, it could be asset classes and so on and so forth. So in this dilemma of buying and selling and when you should be buying and selling and what you should be buying and selling, timing is really everything. The theory is that you can buy low and sell high. So it's, it's easy, really, in theory. In theory, you buy a company when it's cheap and you sell it when it's expensive or, or an asset class when it's out of favor and you sell it when it's, when it's in favor. And, and really, this, this idea of buying low and selling high is something that, that um, a stock picker um, seeks out when they're looking at, let's say, shares on the JSC. So the idea is that there's, there's, there's 160 listed shares or liquid listed shares, probably only 50 really liquid shares on the JSC. Surely as an investor, you must, you must be able to pick which ones are attractively valued and then, and then buy them at that point and then sell them when they're no longer attractively valued. And that's really the idea. Now, um, the reality is that this idea of of buying a particular share because you have information about it that the rest of the market doesn't um, is, is in fact, in most instances, flawed. Um, and so we've got a statistic here called from, the, from a report called the SPIVA report, which looks at um, S and, uh, SPIVA stands for S&P versus active. And really these active managers are the professional stock pickers. So this is all the big brands that you know um, and, and what this shows uh, as of 30 June 2020, so, you know, very recent statistic, um, and, it, and it shows it through the crash, the, the market crash of recent, is that over a five-year period, 94% of, of professional stock pickers actually underperformed the market. So this idea that you can pick the stock that's going to perform better than the market, or you can buy low and sell high, and outperform the market on, on the back of that is, is in many instances flawed. Um, and, and, and the challenge is, you know, how do you have information better than your, your 
stock pick appears, if I could call it that. Um, and, and how do you know you're actually buying something when it's cheap? You know, how, how do you know your metric of cheapness or relative cheapness is, is accurate? So, you know, there, there's all sorts of challenges. And, and, and of course, timing also comes into it. This is a recent statistic. Um, and, and, and what it shows is, is, is these challenges. But this is not something new. Um, this is the same report um, over the last uh, almost six, seven years. And you can see that over time, th th this is a problem that, that is certainly experienced by the professional stock pickers in South Africa. We're outperforming the market. So the ability to buy low, sell high relative to the market becomes is extremely difficult. And, and of course, uh, I think it's important to note that these are professional stock pickers. So these are, when I say professional, these are uh, individuals who are paid by other people to look after their money and pick stocks for them. So, you know, it's a really challenging environment to stock pick. And, 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 and so, as I mentioned, the, the age old idea that you can buy low and sell high or, or buy the cheap shares and sell the expensive shares um, really, really is more challenging than the theory would suggest. What, what do we say as core shares? Well, I mean, this is all relative to an index called the S&P 50 index. Um, and what we suggest a lot of investors should be doing is rather than trying to, you know, outperform this hurdle, they should, as John Bogle says, don't look for the needle. So don't look for the individual share, but buy the, buy the whole haystack, you know, buy the markets, don't look for the needle. Something else that we talk about at core shares, and, and I'm cognizant that we're speaking to the Easy Equities audience, and there are a number of stock pickers out there, but also you should be looking at blending stock picking with holding the market. So what we call core satellite, of course, core shares comes from this idea of core satellite. So, you know, hold the market as the, as the majority of your portfolio, 60, 70, 80% of your portfolio. And then by all means, if you can do a lot of research on a company, uh, you know, make a bet on that particular company, but, but don't put all your eggs into one basket, uh, so, to, so to speak. Um, so, you know, really the stock picker's dilemma of, I'm going to go all the way back to the, uh, the beginning, you know, deciding what to buy and sell, you know, that's a loaded question because it's extremely difficult. What we believe you should be doing is looking at to buy the market, um, looking to, to sell the market um, and so forth. But the next question is then the tactical allocators dilemma. Again, timing is everything. You know, if we're looking at um, not just shares, but we're looking at asset classes, if we're looking at local equities versus global equities or local property versus global property or all of them against bonds and cash, uh, you know, what should we be buying? Is it not obvious that now is the time to buy local equities and sell global equities? What we want to show here is, is, is how challenging it is to get these macro calls. And why we call them macro calls is because typically what influences uh, asset classes is the macro environment. So interest rates, uh, things like the US elections, which are and the way almost as we speak, uh, you know, these are the big macro events that people think there's a lot of certainty around is Trump or Biden going to take the, the, the presidency and, and what is the outcome of, of, of that. So what this graph shows, and there's a lot of noise here, but it, 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 it's exactly that. It shows that, um, you know, over calendar years, it's very difficult to predict which asset class, let alone which share is going to be the winner uh, next year. If you look here, and it's, it's ironic because property is the, SA property is the most out of favor, probably asset class at the moment. Uh, historically, it's actually got the, num the most number one spots. Over the last 16 odd years, it's got the most number one spots. And this closely followed by global uh, property uh, and global bonds and global equity. So, you know, it, it, really, is, it really is difficult to, to know which asset class is the number one, you know, spot for next year. So you're probably thinking, what the hell, Chris? What the hell, Kosh is? We we wanted to know what to buy and what to sell and when to buy and what and when to sell. And you've just shown us exactly how hard it is to know exactly to know how to do that. So please, you know, help us along here. And and really, what we want to say is take a step back and understand what your what your goals are. So knowing what to buy and what to sell and when to buy and when to sell can actually be simplified by using a very specific goals-based investment approach. Now, at this point, I, I do need to put in a number of disclaimers to say that this does not constitute as financial advice. Um, this is us um, uh, imparting and, and, and talking about factual information 
about markets, about asset classes, about the characteristics of, of both investments and, and, and investment goals. So deciding what to buy and sell should really be dictated by your goals. What do I mean by goals? Well, is your goal retirement? Is it an emergency fund? Is it your children's schooling or a holiday? So by creating a financial goal, we can with a lot more certainty know exactly what to buy and sell. And we can do this because we can start defining the, the outcome of that goal and we can start defining the very nuances of that goal. So, you know, is it a short-term goal? Is it a medium-term goal? Is it a long-term goal? Retirement for young people is a very long-term goal as an example, um, but maybe an emergency fund is, is, is short-term in nature. You want to save up your emergency fund as quickly as possible. There's a lot of uncertainty in the job market at the moment, just as an example. Um, you don't really want to hang around at the moment without some, some you know, let's, let's call it safe money to, to fall back on. So defining your goals is extremely important and defining the time horizon of that goal is extremely important. Um, as I say, it could be short, medium or long term, but it also could be multiple events. Retirement is an interesting goal because let's say you're 45, you want to retire at 65, you've got the retirement event, but then you actually have a whole lot of multiple events during retirement. They could be uh, just your drawdowns uh, in, in your income, uh, which would be a, potentially a monthly uh, goal, or, or it could be a liquidity event that you're going to sell your house during your retirement and move into a retirement uh, home, as, just as an example. So, you know, the, the goals can be quite complex, but they can, can also be really simple. It can be in five years, I want to go on holiday with my family and kids, um, and I'm going to need to save up 50,000 Rand. And, and then we can define a goal with a lot of certainty. The next thing we need to understand when you need to know or, or want to know what you need to buy and sell is your risk appetite. Now, risk appetite is, is, is very technically and, and based on the CFA definitions, it's driven by your willingness to uh, accept risk and, and your willingness to accept risk is, is, is often very personal. So it might be a, a, a personal uh, a preference that you don't want risk or that you like taking on a lot of risk. You know, if you're a gambling kind of person, you, you may think that you, you, you are happy taking on more risk. But in many instances, your willingness to take on risk is constrained by your ability to take on risk. Now, what impacts your ability to take on risk is, is a number of different things. That it's, it's based on your current personal financial circumstances. So, you know, for example, do you have a lot of debt? Um, do you have a steady income or are you a freelance? Money as it comes in or a real estate agent who's got commission, commission based, for example. So that, that will impact your ability to take on risk. Or are you, you know, a senior executive at Standard Bank and are earning a, a solid monthly salary that you can bank, uh, for, you know, for the next five years? So that ability to take on risk is driven by your personal circumstances, by your debt levels, by the amount of money you've already saved. You know, if you're sitting on 100 million rand, you can take on a lot more risk than someone who's got debt of 100,000 rand and has got 5,000 rand saved in theory. The other thing that drives that ability to take on risk is your time horizon. So how long do you have to save for this goal? Or how, you know, how young are you? Typically, the older you get, the, the lower your ability to take on risk. Um, all, all things equal um, remain. So understanding your financial goals um, is extremely important. And if we know what our goals are, then we know what investments we need to make to match those goals. Now, the insurance world and the pension fund world talks about asset and liability matching. What we talk about is goals-based investing. Our goal in the future is essentially a liability and our asset is the investment that we make. So investing into shares or bonds uh, or equities in order to match that particular investment goal. So that 50,000 Rand holiday in five years, we want our investment to get to a point where it's gonna match it. And we wanna do that with a level of certainty. And that's really the difference between investing and speculating is, creating a goal and then creating an investment to match that goal with a high level of certainty. And so when we talk about what to buy and sell, we want to speak about asset classes. We want to talk about high level um, asset classes. Now this gives you an idea of risk and return characteristics of asset classes over long periods of time. This is over north of 100 years. Um, and what you see broadly is that on the bottom left where you've got low levels of return, but also low levels of risk, 
you've got uh, uh, SA cash and you've got global cash and you've got your cash and cash proxies. And then as you move up the risk and return spectrum, you move through bonds and then towards equities and property. So your risky assets are also the assets that you're compensated for in terms of high levels of return in the long term. So, so this is, these are, as I mentioned, this is over 100 years. You know, what is the average risk and return characteristic of these underlying asset classes? So this tells us something. This tells us that um, you know, we're not going to get such great returns out of cash, but it's a lot lower risk. So, so how does this help us in terms of our financial goals? And, and, and how it does help us is it helps us define which asset class we should invest in based on the time horizon of our goal. So if we've got a, a, a long, very long-term goal, let's say it's a holiday house in 20 years that you want to save up for. When you turn 60, you want to buy a, a, an apartment in Mschlange. Um, then you can invest in riskier assets because the time horizon, now I've switched the risk to the time horizon, you'll see here um, the appropriate time horizon, investment time horizon for the asset classes which give more return is longer than those with shorter uh, time horizon. So typically, when we've got an investment goal that's very short term in nature, so an investment goal for six months or one year, the professional advice would be to say invest that into cash or cash equivalents. Now, the reason why we would do that is because an investor would have a lot more certainty of outcome when they invest in cash uh, based on a very short term goal. So, so looking at your goals uh, in the very short term, say six months to a year, investors would have a lot more certainty that, that their investment outcome will be met if they invest in cash versus investing in, let's say, equity. Now, equities are extremely volatile. So what that means is in the short term, you've got a lot of uncertainty in your outcome, which means you've got a lot of uncertainty in achieving your goal. So that's why time horizon of goals is extremely important in understanding whether you should be investing in shares or property or bonds or equity um, and, and all of those other factors that I, 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 I briefly touched on, risk appetite, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, this gives you a good idea of deciding what to buy and sell. As I said, if you've got a goal for six months, you're probably going to be investing in cash or cash equivalents. Now, now that's, that's because you've got the highest chance of achieving your goal by doing so. But if you've got your 20-year uh, holiday home goal, then investing in equities, um, global and local equities and property is more appropriate because those are your big growth assets. You've got the ability to take on the risk because your time horizon is so low. Now, the question is, what happens if your goal is like three and a half years away? That becomes a little bit more complicated. And in fact, a colleague, Michelle, is going to be covering portfolio construction in one of our next webinars, where she's going to be looking at exactly how you put these asset classes together to, to, to have an outcome that closely aligns with your goal. So that three and a half year goal, um, it's funny because you're not really sitting purely uh, in bonds. You're sitting somewhere with a bit of equity. So how do you blend equities and bonds and cash to, to achieve that goal? So it can, it's not as simple as just buying property uh, and equities or cash. Sometimes you're actually blending these asset classes, so deciding what to buy and sell um, appropriately so that you can achieve your financial goals. And, and really, that's, that's what's important. But now this all seems extremely uh, confusing but, but as I said, if you zoom out, if you look at the long-term numbers, what you see is that achieving goals, achieving return hurdles becomes more manageable um, when you do so in, in, a, very tact, in a very strategic way. Um, and, and, and this is just an example of that. So if, if you look at the short term, you know, the, the chance of you just protecting your money from inflation, um, if we look at equities, over a seven-year period um, is, 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 is 89% versus bonds sitting at, at 63%. And, and then as we go, uh, equities or, or at least inflation plus 5%, um, it's, it's amazing how drastic the difference is. So what this is just really trying to show is that for long-term goals, we can see that it's more appropriate to be invested in equities than bonds. But for short-term for, for short goals, 
this 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 kind of uh, view reverses. If we look at shorter term horizons, like three years, suddenly you've actually got a higher chance of achieving your goal by investing in cash and bonds than you do by investing in equities. It's not to say that there won't be a three year period of equities where you absolutely shoot the lights out and outperform bonds and cash, but it is to say that you've got more certainty of outcome when you invest in cash and bonds. And that's really what we're talking about here. So I'm going to just zoom back and look at you know, this, this same graphic that I pulled up right at the beginning where we looked at you know, understanding these macro calls. This is very difficult. Um, you know, the different asset classes chopping and changing through time. But then we want to show you that actually this is manageable for investors. If we zoom out from the individual asset classes, and you'll see I've, I've highlighted them either red or blue. Red is the growth or the risky assets. So this is equity and property, and then and then the blue is the safe or the you know the defensive assets. These are the typically used for short-term goals, uh, and, and the and the growth assets or the risky assets used for longer-term goals. So as you can see here, you know time horizon. The shorter-term goals here are the blue ones, and then the longer-term goals here are the red ones. Now what we can see is that in one year there's a lot of uncertainty. You know should we be in defensive cash and bonds or or, 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 or growth assets, and, and, and that makes it difficult to, with certainty, apply our, our, our investments to a particular asset class. And typically, we would be in cash or bonds in the short term. If we go to three years, it's, it's equally uncertain. Five years, the picture starts to change. We start to see that risky assets or growth assets are at the top of the chart every time. Seven years, they start to float to the top even further. And 10 years, we can see that if we've got a 10 year goal, we know with quite a lot of certainty that our growth assets are gonna be up at the top of the charts. Now, now that is asset allocation and that is investing because we're creating more certainty of outcomes by investing in the right asset classes. And if I go all the way back to the beginning again, we're also talking here about buying the whole haystack. So buying the whole market and not trying to pick a stock because what can be to the detriment of this picture is if you're invested in the right asset classes, but have got your stock picks wrong, and then your risky assets actually underperform cash and defensive assets. So when we're talking about, you know, what to buy and sell, we're talking about buying and selling the right investment for your investment goal. Buying, the, buying and selling the right investment for you as an investor, not about speculative, um, short-term opportunities to buy and sell uh, shares or, or asset classes to make a quick buck. We're talking about investments, and 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 really that that's important. We're talking about long long-term investments. The one question in this what to buy and sell that keeps coming up, and we want to touch on it briefly because it really is a hot topic at the moment. So you know we wanted to deal with it. Is how much money should be going offshore? Now it's a bit of a loaded question. Because really, it's as simple as going back to this investment goal slide and saying, well, what is your goal? You know, is your goal for an overseas holiday? Well, then you should probably be putting all that money offshore um, to match that particular cost. If it's, if it's a holiday to the USA, put your money into US dollar-based investments and, and you're probably best off. So you know, it depends on your goal. Re retirement goal is more challenging. And, and then pre-retirement, um, so saving up for retirement, partic within particular inside of a retirement annuity or a provident or a pension fund, you are constrained by a regulation called Regulation 28. So usually what happens there is that investors just take the maximum offshore they can, so 30%. But if we zoom out further and say, okay, well, how much money should I be investing offshore? What we like to usually refer to clients is, is not investing offshore based on their current view of the RAND dollar or global equities, but actually looking at your holistic portfolio and understanding your exposure in that portfolio. And what usually flags up is something called a home bias. Now, it's interesting um, is that a home bias is, 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 we might actually in South Africa, one way of saying it is be having a reverse home bias at the moment where investors have become so negative about South Africa that they just invest offshore um, without considering the local opportunity set. But typically with investors, what we have is something called a home bias, 
And what a home bias means is that you tend to invest in your local market. Now, you tend to invest in your local market for a number of reasons. One is, as I mentioned, simply regulatory. So from a pension fund, a lot of people's biggest savings is their retirement savings or their pension fund savings. You are constrained to invest only 30% offshore. Um, I'm just going to caveat that there is some interesting stuff coming out of the Reserve Bank at the moment, um, which, which we may be able to give some updates on uh, in a few weeks. It literally came out in the last day. So we're absorbing it and getting legal views on it and so forth. But, but what is interesting is that most investors are regulatory, cons regulatory uh, constrained in terms of how much they can go offshore. They often will have, let's say, for example, their home, their family home is based in South Africa, and that's a big part of their portfolio. Let's say you've got a, a, an apartment uh, worth a million rand, and you've got an investment portfolio of 200,000 rand. Well, you can quickly see that your South African assets are actually the, by far the biggest part of your total portfolio. Your job will be uh, typically South African based. So when you add all of these things up, what you often find is that even if you're investing all of your money on easy equities offshore, you still have a massive home bias. And what does this really mean? It means that when you're investing offshore, you're not doing it speculatively because of the Rand dollar, but actually you're just trying to diversify. You're just trying to get exposure into a global opportunity source. South Africa makes up less than, less than 1% of global markets. This is based on market cap weighted approach, uh, an MSCI world tap uh, approach. So you can see very quickly that even if you're sitting with only 20% of your portfolio in South Africa, actually from a global perspective, you're not that well diversified. Now I do need to caveat that with, there's a lot of risk, for example, in a retirement portfolio, if you've got a big proportion offshore, the risk is that, um, the volatility from the currency significantly can impact how much money you can draw out of your portfolio, and that's actually what you're living off. So volatility from currency can impact, you, you know, retirement portfolios. In the short term, for short-term goals, if we go back to goals-based investing, volatility in the currency can absolutely wreak havoc with with your with your chance of achieving your goal. So again, you need to understand the asset class, how it behaves. And how are you going to match it up with your goal? But so what we say is when people say, well, you know, how much should they invest offshore? Well, actually, what you should be doing is zooming out, looking at your holistic portfolio, looking at how much offshore exposure you really have relative to all those other things. As I said, your job, your property, your, your pension fund, your, your tax-free savings account, your emergency fund, and then, and then pull in your sort of discretionary investment account and see, see how much exposure you actually do have in South Africa. And you'd be surprised most of the time how high it is, even if you, as I said, investing all of your money on easy equities offshore. You'd be surprised when you do that exercise, that holistic exercise, how much SA Inc. Uh, exposure you actually have. So what we say is look at your holistic portfolio. Once you've done that, look at how much you can afford to invest offshore. Um, and by all means, maximize that offshore exposure. Not, not, not as a function of trying to make a quick buck, but as a function of diversifying your investment portfolio. And then also be cognizant of your goals. So the offshore question falls into this goals-based investing approach, without any doubt. And, 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 and one of the investments that you could make to match that goal is an offshore investment, but it certainly should be compared against all of the opportunities within that opportunity set. So thank you for your time. That is it with the formal presentation. I hope you guys enjoyed that. And you know, you've got uh, a lot of questions to ask me. Uh, Michelle is also on the line from CoreShares. So if, if, if you'd like to, you know, Michelle might jump in. This is an idea of our property, of, of our, at least our portfolio range from SA equity to global equity and global property and local property. Um, and, and please ask as many questions as you like. I'm, I'm here for as long as you like to take questions. There's, we've also got an info at CoreShares emailing address if you've got any questions. And, and of course, you can contact Sean uh, or the Easy Equities teams for any questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, that was an awesome presentation. I specifically like the asset allocation graph and over the period of years. Um, so thanks so much for, for sharing everything with us today. Um, we do have a few questions here in the question box, and like Chris said, please hit us with more, and um, I'll pass them on to Chris for you guys. But the first one we have there is, what does SA Cash mean? Does it mean I invest in banks? 
No. So so what it means is 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 quite literally you 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 investing in cash. So what that means is you're not investing in the bank per se. You're investing in a deposit at the bank, like a money market account, or alternatively a money market fund, which is a fund that invests in other short-term uh, cash investments. So as I mentioned, it's like having having your money on deposit with the bank is a cash investment. Um, and yes, you are taking in the very short term, you're taking some credit risk. So in other words, you are taking some risk to the bank as a counterpart, but those outcomes of returns are guaranteed. And, in, and, and equivalently, you are protected by the Reserve Bank. So the South African Reserve Bank will in most instances bail out depositors at banks if a bank is to go bankrupt. If you invest in the bank's shares, in their equities, then what happens is that investment actually behaves like these ones out on the top right here. So those are shares, they're volatile. You know, there's no undertaking from the Reserve Bank to bail you out as a shareholder. You stand right at the end of the queue um, of, uh, in, in terms of if the business goes bankrupt, who, who gets protection and help. A shareholder is, is effectively responsible for that, for, the, for, for their own investment. So no, it's not investing in the banks like investing into FNB or Standard Bank. Um, it's investing into one of their deposits or one of their 30 day call accounts or, or, you know, as I mentioned, a money market investment account. Thanks, so Chris. Our next question is um, saying, I don't really understand what you're saying when you talk about offshore. Um, do you mean about the ETFs that you can buy in, in, that are investing in uh, offshore products? Yeah, so so when I talk about offshore, I mean any investment that is not domiciled in South Africa. So, you know, if you're buying shares that are in the USA or in the UK or in China, that would be an offshore investment. You might also buy an ETF on South, in the South African market, uh, like our S&P 500, which although you're buying it in South Africa, it references an offshore basket of shares. So that would be an offshore investment. So when I talk about offshore, I mean about investing in any instrument that references a market that's not South Africa. And that can be cash, it can be you know, uh, just investing in currency, uh, it can be investing in global bonds, it can be investing in global shares. Thanks Chris, the next question we have there is saying, I'd like to invest a little for my parents' retirement in about five to 10 years. What asset class would you suggest then for this? So, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we really can't do specific recommendations for clients, but, you know, five to 10 years. Um, so, so if I just unpack that question, you'd like to invest for your parents' retirement in five to 10 years. I mean, there are a few financial kind of planning goals or tricks that, that I think are going to be missed there. The first is that when you invest in retirement, as the individual whose retirement it is, so in other words, if I invest into my own retirement annuity, then you get a tax um, deduction. So it's essentially pre-tax. So if you invest your own money on your parents' behalf, um, you may lose that tax deduction. So, so there's a benefit that you might be missing there. What you should rather be doing is almost gifting that money to your parents. And, and then you've got a gifting allowance every year within the tax uh, legislation. And then they make that investment and get the tax deduction if they are, of course, taxable. Um, or if they're earning taxable income, then they would be, uh, you know, taxable and, and, and an opportunity there. So that's the first thing, like from a financial planning perspective. I think it's also important for me to say that I know there's a lot of DIY investors in the easy equities environment doing it themselves. But there's a, there's a, when you do take the DIY route, there's a huge burden on you. And you need to understand that there's a massive responsibility for you to do a lot of homework. As much as financial advisors get a bad rap, there are a lot of good advisors out there. And they know a lot of stuff, um, and they know and they know how to best invest for you. Okay, so the first thing would be tax on that question. You know, just understand and unpack exactly: Are you getting the tax benefit from a typical retirement investment? Um, so, so investing for someone's retirement then would typically be in like a retirement annuity or or, or in a, a provident or a pension fund. Most likely would be a retirement annuity in this instance because you, you know you would be investing. Not in, their, not in their capacity as an employee. Um, so those are the first two things. Um, from an asset allocation perspective, you've painted quite a wide picture. So five to 10 years, you know, that's a big difference. If you're investing for five years or 10 years, it actually makes a massive difference in asset allocation. 
Um, so, so you need to be quite specific about your retirement date um, and, and, and perhaps have flexibility on retirement date if you're trying to save up a particular amount of, of money. And then the, then, then the last thing would be to say that if you are using a retirement product for retirement savings, which would be kind of the, 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 the most typical way of doing it because of the tax uh, advantage, well, then you're looking at uh, an investment into a Regulation 28 constrained environment. So that means you can't have more than 30% offshore. You can't have more than 75% in equities, both local and global, just as an example. Um, you can't have more than 25% invested in property. So you're overlaying a whole lot of constraints that actually would take your asset allocation. So, you know, I hope that gives you some picture and some kind of idea of, of where and, and, and what you should be doing. As I mentioned, the, by no means advice for your particular question, but uh, there are definitely some facts that I can, you know, put, put back together and help you on your journey there. Thanks a lot, Chris. The next one we have there is regarding tax. And it's saying if I buy and sell shares quickly, am I going to be taxed more? Um, if I keep shares for over three years and then sell them, do I pay less tax? So it's, it's the nature of the tax. The nature of the tax, if you're buying and selling quickly, is taxable as income, essentially, like you would be taxed on interest or on your salary. So, you know, whereas if you hold for long term, um, and the, the, the old rule was three years, but it, there, there is some discretion around that three years, but, but, you know, again, seek advice from a tax advisor because it really does become extremely nuanced and particular. But if you hold for long periods of time, then that gain is taxed as, as capital gains tax. And, and typically that would be lower for individuals then their marginal tax rate in terms of being taxed as income. So that's usually why, you know, a long-term hold is more tax efficient than short-term. Um, also, you're triggering a lot of tax events when you're buying and selling. So you, you're triggering a, a tax which is often glossed over called securities transfer tax, STT. That's 0.25% every time you buy an equity or a share. That's taxable in your hands. Um, so if you're buying and selling frequently and your turnover uh, increases a lot, that, that tax can become meaningful. Um, but yeah, it, essentially, short-term trading, uh, you tax as income, long-term tax as capital gains tax. Of course, holding an investment, that investment itself will generate income typically of some sort, either dividends or interest or property income. Now that is taxed at, 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 as its nature. So it's called a conduit principle. In other words, dividends are taxed uh, in, in your hands as dividends and, uh, and income uh, or, or interest would be taxed as interest in your hands as an investor. So, so, so there would be that byproduct of tax that comes out of a long-term hold, but typically that's a smaller amount than, than you know, selling your whole portfolio at a gain of 20%, just as an example, in the short term. Yeah, thanks a lot, Chris. Our next one here is um, asking are international ETFs that are domiciled in South Africa, like some core shares products, exposed to currency risk, i.e. strengthening RAND, would that erode returns? Yes, they would, absolutely. Um, so let's, let me give you an example, because it's, I think uh, just an illustrative example is the easiest way to, to describe it. The S&P 500, let's say you invest in the S&P 500 at the beginning of winter, okay, in January, the, the S&P actually is flat for the whole year. So your underlying shares don't deliver you any return, but the currency weakens 50%, just as an example. So the rand to dollar weakens 50%. Your investment would then increase by 50%. So if you invest 100 rand, it would move to 150 rand. However, if the rand strengthens by 50%, your investment would weaken by 50%. So your investment would go from 100 Rand to 50 Rand. So yes, absolutely, you're exposed to currency risk. The risk that you're exposed to investing in locally domiciled ETFs, like our core shares S&P 500 referencing offshore assets, is that the Rand strengthens. So you essentially are making a bet that the Rand will weaken in the long term, and you're making a bet that those shares in whichever markets, the US market, will also increase in value over the long term. Um, in the long term, uh, th th those are the bets you're making. And in the short term, it can be quite drastic of how the currency moves. Just to give you an example, Rand dollar was out almost at 20 this year. 
um, it's now back to the, the 16 rand mark. I don't, I haven't seen where it is today, but you know, always with, with events like elections on the go, there's a lot of volatility. So you almost need to see through that short-term noise um, uh, in that instance. But yeah, that's a good question. And that's how the behavior works of those kind of underlying investments. Great, thanks, Chris. You made that very clear. Our next one is saying, with being a first-time investor, what is the best way to start investing? What's the safest way? And how long do you, do you think you need to spend online to learn trading uh, strategies? So the best way to start, um, as, I, as I kind of alluded to earlier, is to actually define your goals. What, what are your investment goals? They, they kind of, there are a few in the, in the world of investments, there are a few non-negotiables. So, you know, in theory, you should be clearing all your debt first, as an example. I mean, I'm not talking about, I'm talking in particular about short-term debt. So credit card debt, uh, accounts at shops, and, you know, that kind of like debt you should be getting out of, out of the system ASAP. You know, long-term home loans and stuff are, are, are healthier forms of debt, although all debt is, is, has the power of compound that, that erodes your kind of your pocket. So start with your goals. One of the first goals that, that most advisors would recommend is an emergency funds. So, you know, do you have a backup if you're, if you're coming to work tomorrow and, and your boss tells you that because of COVID, they've had to let go of half the staff and you're one of them, you know, do you have three to six months of cash reserves so that you can survive and pay all your monthly expenses, your medical aid and your rent and all, all your home loan and you know, all those kind of things. So emergency fund is the first thing to start with. You know, then you can move on to you know, using uh, some of these uh, allowances like tax-free savings accounts, a great way to start investing, but you really should be thinking long-term. I believe they should be called tax-free investment accounts because savings implies that it's like a short-term saving to go and buy some shoes, but you actually get biggest benefit of having no tax and getting tax-free uh, exemption um, is long-term investments. So, so tax-free savings is a nice place to start. And then, of course, your retirement is an obvious place to start um, investing for, and then setting up very specific goals. Uh, your kids' education in five years, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The, the question about setting, um, you probably would have noted from my um, introduction, I, I personally think it's going to be very difficult for you to, be, to, to, to learn how to trade in over any period of time, be it six months or 60 years. Um, these are professionals here who are, in essence, and they're not trading necessarily, but they are uh, buying and selling to, to, make, to, to outperform the market. You can see just how difficult it is. These are actuaries and CFAs, and these are people who've been doing it not for two to 10 months or two years, these are people who've been doing it for 20, 30 years. And it is extremely difficult and these are extremely smart people. So, you know, I, I am kind of all for by the, by the needle and not the haystack, um, but there, there's a lot of trading that happens out there and I kind of want to, you know, overstep my mark or, you know, by all means do your homework. We're all out in trading is not to put all your eggs in one basket, make sure that whichever platform you're trading through is, is regulated and, you know, is, is an authorized financial services provider and, you know, do all your homework because there are a lot of quite scary trading schemes out there that exist um, that are really intended to take your money and not to earn you any money. Um, but being at Easy Equities, you know, that's a good place to start. So, yeah, I'll, I'll hand over the trading stuff to Sean, I think. If, if, if Sean, you want to add anything to that. Thanks, Chris. Um... That was a great answer. Also, the sound is coming and going a little bit, so I don't know if it's just, um, we can hear you, but it's just becoming a little bit patchy at the end there. Uh, apologies. Um, no, no, no worries. We have a question regarding, um, you spoke about offshore earlier, and they're just saying, um, what was Chris's point regarding offshore in a nutshell? In a nutshell, look at your total portfolio. Analyze, you know, everything within your investment portfolio, your retirement portfolio, your, your cash on deposit at the bank, your, your tax free savings account, your, even, even look at your, things like your, your home and your, you know, all of your assets. If you do a personal balance sheet, look at how much exposure you have offshore versus local. If you find that you have a huge amount local, locally invested, it's probably a good idea to diversify and, and invest offshore. That, that is, that is the, the, the nutshell. If you find actually you've got quite a lot of short, then, then it's a different conversation altogether. 
and then, and then as a, a that's an action of, of the point of home bias um, but as a caveat to that understand your financial goal because if you understand your financial goal you'll understand whether it's appropriate to invest offshore or not as opposed to speculating on on, on rand dollar or rand hard currency and, and other under, underlying equity markets Thanks, Chris. Um, guys, are there any other questions? We have one or two more here, but please just make sure you put them in, in the question box if you want to, if you want Chris to get to them. Um, Chris, any other questions we have here regarding like they want to know people want to know what to invest for for a period of time. So I think you can go back to your graph and just say what asset class were over that year. We have one question you're asking: what's the best option to invest for a child's education who is who is eight years old? So again, we need we need to define these goals more specifically. So the child is eight years old, but you know, are you investing for their education next year or are you investing for their university education? Because that changes how you will invest. Um, and and it, it can change it, you know, quite drastically. So, you know, you really need to be specific about your goals. Um, and, and let's say if it's for university, um, and I'm going to use a very simple example here, but let's say it's for university and in particular, you want to send your kid to university in the UK. Well, then it's 15 years out. You could probably start investing in global equities to get your best inflation growth um, and best investment growth over that 15 year period. If it's saving up for, um, you know, I'm not going to take a gamble, you know, standard two um, next year then you should be in something like cash because you've got a very short time horizon and you can't afford to bet your kids' school fees on the equity markets. We can, we can see how volatile they can be in the short term. So, you know, again, be specific, understand what you are exactly are saving for um, and, and try and simplify things. You know, don't, don't make your life complicated and um, create specific goals. Thanks, Chris. We have uh, one more coming in here asking, what would be the best option to invest for a monthly income? I'm, I'm going to sound like I'm a stuck record here, but again, you need to be really specific. You need to, I need, you need to know, you know, okay, this monthly income, you know, are you actually 25 and working and just want a little bit of extra cash or are you retired and completely dependent on that monthly income? Because that, that'll change how you invest. You know, if you are, 25 and still working and just want some extra cash, maybe invest in equities that have high dividends because you can invest, you can afford to stay invested over the long term. If you are, are retired and require that income as a as as your staple, you know, living money, then very different. Then you're probably looking at a multi-asset construct with um, bonds and cash and some income generative assets alongside with equities and property, which are inflationary protective. So um, in one of our next webinars, Michelle is going to be talking about how you put together portfolios for particular goals. So I'd encourage you to, you know, to tune into that. But again, you need to be specific about your goal. You need to know exactly what you want. Look at what your risk appetite is. You know, if you don't get that income because you're 25 and you've got your salary to fall back on, well, then that's not the end of the world. But if you don't get that income because and you're retired, then you've got a big problem because you can't put food on the table. So that really can be chalk and cheese in terms of uh, you know, the different goals and, and even something as simple as I just want monthly income, you know, can be a very different uh, goal or investment to match your goal. Thanks, Chris. I have one or two comments here asking if the, the, the recording of this webinar, there will be the recording, it is recorded and it will be sent to you tomorrow, as well as if you're looking for a recording with Chris's presentation, it will be up on our Easy ETFs platform um, by tomorrow on our Easy ETFs webinar page. Um, I see there's one, one, one other question that's come in here um, saying there are, there are adverts online about Amazon and Netflix investments. Are they safe to invest in? So I'm not sure which adverts you're referring to, um, and I'm not sure what you mean by safe, because, and I'm going to unpack that in a few ways. So, so the first thing is, I mean, I don't know who this investment is through. So I would go as far as to say, you know, if you're investing into Amazon and Netflix through an authorized financial service provider who's a member of the exchange, like uh, Easy Equities is, then your money is safe from a perspective that, you know, that, that, that 
member of the exchange, that stockbroker who is regulated and who needs to hold capital and all these good things, they're not going to run away with your money or there's a very low chance uh, they're going to run away with your money. And if they do, you'll be protected by the regulator. If it's an investment into Netflix and, and, and Amazon through, through like a bucket shop that's a fly-by-night operation, then I can't comment if your money is going to be safe. Um, so so, it's a, like there, there are differences in terms of how you access those investments. The investments themselves um, are equities. Um, so they shares. So they, they are, you know, dependent on your goal, they could be safe or unsafe. And that's why I mean, that's why I said I don't, don't know what you mean by safe. In the very short term, they're probably unsafe from a perspective that they're extremely volatile. But in the long, so, so they, they're less safe than cash. But in the long term, because they're going to generate better returns being equities than cash, they're probably safer than cash. So, so you need to understand what your goal is. And, and, and the, 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 the safety of your investment is relative to your goal. So short term, you know, don't invest in, in equities because you, you're probably going to uh, uh, burn your fingers. Long term, you know, you, you could be invested in equities and it could be considered a safe investment because your goal is to maximize return over a 10 year period. And then again, I'm going to refer you to, to, to this graph. So buying one share, the risk you run is that you just, you know, buying Amazon and Netflix, you know, great. But the risk that you do run is that you're buying yesterday's winners, which could be tomorrow's losers, and then you underperform the market. So going all the way back to don't look for the needle, buy the haystack. If you're looking for um, uh, US tech, rather go and buy a US tech ETF and hold that whole basket of shares, um, which has, you know, Amazon and Netflix and Google and Microsoft and so on and so forth. And, you know, that would be our view is to diversify, not, not take on single stock risk. Um, yeah, you, you can imagine the amount of research that's been done on Amazon globally. It's one of the biggest shares in the world. You know, every man and his dog, from professional investors to investment banks to hedge funds to, you know, have done research on those businesses. So you probably find that the price that's reflected today, um, you know, is, ref is a reflection of all of that research that's done. Uh, whether you, can, you know more than those guys is debatable. Thanks, Chris. We have a question. Uh, uh, during your presentation, you spoke about world cash. What, what exactly does that mean? Just like local cash, you invest in very short term like deposits with banks or, 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 or in, in, the, in the global environment, you can invest in short term government uh, cash investments. So in other words, it's, it's like a deposit um, in hard currency. Essentially, you'd be getting some small yield or income compensation. Um, and then you get the offshore currency exposure. Not many, I, I, I can add to that, to put some more color around that. Not many South African investors invest in offshore cash. The reason is, is because you get a lot of volatility from the currency. So there's a lot of volatility that comes from the RAND uh, exchange rate relative to other currencies. Um, and the yield is very low globally and typically compared to the yield that you can get locally. So a money market account could, could yield you nine or 6%, let's say, in interest. Whereas if you go to a US money market account, it's going to be close to zero. So there's not much income you generate from it, and you get a lot of volatility, which means from a, from a, a financial tool perspective, you know, global cash would be just used as a diversifier, typically not as an income generator, like local cash would be an income generator. and also you get a lot of symmetry out of, out of um, uh, you know, the short-term RAND-based local cash if you've got a RAND-based investment goal. If you invest 100 RAND into a deposit, it's going to be worth 103 RAND in six months, as an example. But if you invest 100 RAND into a global cash and the currency strengthens 20%, it's suddenly going to be, uh, you know, sitting at 80 RAND and you're not going to achieve your goal. So you need to understand the whole picture need to understand the volatility of the currency um, and so forth. Thanks a lot, Chris. We have one more question on the board here, and it's saying that if uh, I don't have the full amount of money to invest in an ETF, is it advisable to buy a fraction of the ETF, or is it better to wait until I have the, the full amount of money to buy the full ETF? Sean, I mean, you can also touch on that. As far as I understand, Easy, Easy Equities has fractional 
shareholding across the board. So shares and ETFs and a whole lot, you can invest a random amount. Um, perhaps I've got that wrong, Sean, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, I just wanted to, yeah, you, you promoted the equities for that, no, I'm joking. There we go, there we go. <laughs> yeah, so, so it, yeah. it's the same as buying the full share. I mean, if you can only purchase a quarter of it, you'll get exactly the same returns that, that you would get that in a quarter versus if you have the whole thing. So, you know, you can't give advice, but I mean, I would I would buy the, the, the fraction and then carry on purchasing it out when you've got the rest of the money in. 100%. Um, sorry, Chris, we've got, we've, got a, we've got two more coming in while you're answering that. I think we have time for them. Are you happy with that? Yes, sure. What are, they're asking, what are the pros and cons of a preference share versus compared to ordinary shares? So a preference share is a hybrid instrument. It, uh, it has preferential rights to income, so to dividends. Um, so in other words, a company must pay out their preference shareholders dividends before they pay their ordinary shareholders dividends. However, most preference shares are contractual in nature. So they are issued at a par value. So let's say 100 Rand. They do trade on the market away from par, but they typically come with a contractual dividend attached to it. So it, and usually it would be a percentage of prime. So 100% of prime will be paid to you as a dividend twice a year um, into perpetuity. That's a preference share. So you know, you're going to get 6% as a dividend um, into perpetuity. The capital value, so the, that par value, let's say it was issued at 100 Rand, can um, uh, fluctuate away from par. However, um, it's, it's not the same as an ordinary share where you enjoy the growth participation. So an ordinary share, you would typically, your share price would grow in line with the growth of the earnings and the dividends. And, and if the company is growing at a, at a huge rate, let's say a company like Naspers, you know, if you invested in Naspers 10 years ago, you, you know, your capital has grown 20 fold. If you invested in their preference share, it probably hasn't grown at all, but, but they would be paying all their dividends um, out through that period. So just, just to give you an example. So it's, it's kind of got the characteristics of debt, like bonds, and of equity because the nature of the income is, is dividends. Thanks, Chris. Our, our last one that we have is um, if you buy a share in a bank, for example, Absa or Capitec, would that be correct to look this as a long term investment? Yes, absolutely. That, that would be um, investing in the equity of the company or you're investing in shares, so you're a shareholder of the, co of the company. And that would absolutely be a long-term investment. That would be, you know, out on the far top right there of that graph, ten, you know, seven years plus uh, kind of investment. If you invested in a Capitec deposit, you, you could see that as a short-term investment. But so that's very different. You're either a depositor of the bank or a shareholder of the bank, and you've got very different characteristics of your investments in those two. Thanks a lot, Chris, and thanks for that one. Um, I think that's a wrap for today. So thank you to all of you for joining us. Take your time out of the day to join us. And thank you very much to you, Chris, for sharing insight and sharing your presentation with us again. Pleasure, Sean. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Send us questions if you have, and also, or, or send Sean, and, and we can collaborate and come back to you. 100%. And please uh, make sure to, to check out for the next course webinar and, and not to miss it. It'll be as good as this one. Have a good day.